how many of you work in the robotics industry already? I really envy you because uh, you're, you're doing something that I, I wish I could be much more a part of. I, I have loved robots uh, since I was a kid. Um, I have twin uh, four and a half year old daughters and I've got them loving robots too. And I will talk a little bit uh, today. Um, I, I'm, I see that I've got the imagination part of from imagination to market. So what I'm hoping to give you here is a brief overview of how we have imagined robots throughout all of human history, which obviously is going to be very brief and I'm going to miss a lot of things. You know, guys, you can't really cover this entire topic of robots in science fiction in just half an hour. Uh, but what I'm hoping to do is hit on some high points that you might be familiar with, but maybe give you a different view of them, and maybe hit on some things that you might not necessarily have thought about before. So perhaps this will spark your imagination as you're going back to actually try to make some of these things a reality. Um, so, to begin with, there is actually an early history of robots before robots existed in literary science fiction. Most discussions of robots in science fiction would probably begin somewhere a little further down the line. But I actually wanted to look back a little further before um, the year 1920, which maybe some of you, a lot of you might understand why I bring up the year 1920. If not, I'm going to come to that very soon. Uh, and talk about the fact that we have, from very early years, imagined something like the automaton, you know, an artificial life form or something that gets built. You know, this is not something that was invented in the 20th century as, hey, we have this idea that we can build robots. The idea of something like a robot has existed from well before. And the earliest reference I was able to find, and there's possibly more and other things that I'm not as familiar with, uh, but is the story of the Greek god um, Hephaestus, I think is how it's pronounced. And um, if you go into a lot of, there's actually more than just this particular story. There are stories, if you go back to Greek literature, um, Greek mythology, you know, other types of mythology too, of what they call the automaton. Uh, but in particular, um, there's a mention in the Iliad in Book 18 about Hephaestus having been assisted by two golden women statues. And I actually, it's funny, before I was giving this talk and I was trying to put all this stuff together, I found myself saying, oh my god, I need a classicist, stat. Because, you know, it's not the sort of thing you'd think that you want a classics professor when you're giving a talk about robots and engineering in the modern era. But I realized to get that full picture, I wanted to go back to, as, you know, as far back as possibly as we could. And the idea here is that Hephaestus, who was a, a forger and built many different things, he did not just build these two golden women statues. If you go look it up, you can find the reference and the discussion in the Iliad about how they assisted and helped him out. But there's also stories of other larger or smaller automatons that were built. Um, if you move a little forward also in uh, mythology, you have the story of Pygmalion and Galatea. And again, you might not necessarily think of this story as being a story about robots. So for those of you who are not as familiar with the myth, Pygmalion was a sculptor. Uh, he sculpted a woman and he so fell in love with his sculpture that the gods gave her life. Um, and this story has existed in other places. One particular place that's mentioned uh, is Ovid's uh, Metamorphoses, I think that's how it's pronounced. We're going back to the year 8 CE. And um, again, you might not necessarily think of this as a robot story per se. And we, we, you know, we, we have Hephaestus doing something a little more mechanical. We have here, you know, basically the, the magic of a god giving life to a statue. Um, but it, again, it is that, that, that concept that, that starts coming up of creating artificial life, creating something that is like a human being, but was definitely not born like a human being. Um, moving a little further ahead, and I'm sure I'm skipping over many other legends, but this is one I'm a little more familiar with, there is a story, a Jewish legend of the Golem of Prague. And uh, this is generally a legend that dates from the 19th century about supposedly something that took place in the 16th century. The golem is a, basically a creature made of clay. And again, you know, we're not talking about something mechanical, but we are talking about something that is an artificial life form that is shaped to look something like a human being, bilateral symmetry, eyes, arms, legs, all of that. And the story goes that this rabbi, Judah Lowe, built this clay figure in order to protect the Jewish community of Prague. Um, in order to get this figure to come to life, he wrote a Hebrew word 
on its forehead. And you can actually see it in this particular drawing that I found. Uh, the Hebrew word emet, which means truth. Um, over here I've written it, if you read it from right to left, you have the letters aleph, mem, uh, taf, that's the word emet, which means truth. And the story is actually a very interesting one, and it's one that sort of feeds into some other stuff in science fiction before we get to, um, um, before we get to uh, Isaac Asimov, who I'll be bringing up very soon. Uh, but the story goes that he built the golem, and the golem kind of went amok. And he was not able to control the golem after a while. So what he did was he erased the letter Aleph from the word on the golem's forehead, and that left the Hebrew word met, which means death. And so the golem fell over and died. So perhaps this is a warning to us about as we're building our robot structures to make sure that there's always an off switch attached. Otherwise, they'll you know, take over the world. And actually, we'll get to some late 20th century views of that very soon. Um, this is not a robot either. But again, I wanted to mention it in the context of the idea of building an artificial life form. And perhaps you know, today in the modern industry, we're not necessarily looking to build an artificial life form, at least not right away. But I tend to think that in the back of our minds, that's always sort of our final goal when you're a roboticist. You know, the goal is not just to, let's say, build the Roomba. You know, that's not the be-all and the end-all of what we envision when we talk about robots. So the novel Frankenstein, which has a fascinating background in its own right, was published in 1818, written by Mary Shelley. And I don't know how many people here might know the story, but basically Mary Shelley and her husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley, who is a famous poet, um, and a few friends were staying together for a while, and they sort of had a challenge to write a tale, to write some sort of fantastic tale. And it was Mary Shelley's tale that really took fire, that she wrote it, uh, she, you know, she, when it was first published, interestingly enough, was not published under her own name. Um, and it is widely considered the first science fiction novel. Ah, I do have a pointer. How about that? Um, if you read histories of science fiction and science fiction and literature, you sometimes find uh, that Frankenstein is where people start, even though people in the field of literature would classify it as what's called a gothic novel. It has all of the roots of what you want in a science fiction story. Um, it was based on, at the time, a you know, now outdated scientific concept, the concept of galvanism. Um, the scientist Luigi Galvani had put frog legs between electrodes, found that the frog legs jumped. He thought he was actually maybe, you know, had discovered a life force. All it really was was an electric current going through the frog legs, causing the muscles to move. But it was based on that idea, that science at the time, that Mary Shelley wrote her novel. And again, if you remember anything about the Frankenstein story, uh, you have this whole idea that she builds an art, you know, that you know, Victor Frankenstein builds an artificial life form, and the life form is a monster. And you know, at first it's it seems to be okay, but then it goes wild and people start going after it and attacking it. So they're very frightened of this type of creature here. Um, I also want to point out something here that even though the novel dates from 1818, you know, the image I have here is from Boris Karloff from the 1931 movie. This is also something else when we think about robots and science fiction, where we're getting our images and our ideas from. Because, and I'm going to actually talk about that in just a minute, a little more detail. But uh, yeah, again, th this is, you know, it's not what we think of as a robot. Probably none of you here are working with organic materials, per se, in order to build your robots. But it is very much a precursor to the concept of the robot in literary science fiction. Um, However, there are actually a few mechanical men, automatons, that show up in early literature before you think of things as being part of science fiction. I'm just curious, how many people have heard of TikTok of Oz in this crowd? Okay, so a handful of people. Um, those of you who aren't aware of this um, may not know that The Wizard of Oz was actually one of 14 books about Oz that were written by L. Frank Baum, who was the guy who wrote about Oz. Many people, their, their images of Oz come from the movie from 1939, and they don't necessarily realize that there's more that took place after that. The Wizard of Oz book was first published in 1900, and um, it was very much the Harry Potter of its time. It was so popular in the United States, um, I, I think it was also popular internationally, that you know, Baum had to write 13 sequels to satisfy all the kids that wanted more stories. And in one of his books, uh, the third one, I think it is, yeah, Ozma of Oz, 1907, 
he has this mechanical man named TikTok, and here's the John Neal illustration. Um, and it's a very, and I th it is one of the first robots that actually exists in literature, a mechanical robot. Uh, Dorothy comes across him, and it turns out that he has three keys that you have to turn. One of the keys gets his thinking going, one of the keys gets his motion going, one of the keys gets his speaking going. Um, and he's actually a beautifully well-designed mechanical man by these two people, Smith and Tinker. Uh, the problem is that although you find that TikTok can communicate and talk, but interestingly enough, when you start talking about how we envision robots in science fiction, he doesn't have any emotions. So these were all the precursors until we actually get to the word robot. Now this, this is a question. How many of you people here have heard of RUR? Okay, so more people. That's what I would have expected. RUR, which stands for Rossum's Universal Robots, was the first time the word robot was used in literature. And it was this Czech writer, Karol Čapek, who wrote a play called Rossum's Universal Robots about a man named Rossum who, in order to solve a labor shortage, is building all of these robots in order to have them do the work that people would do. And where he gets the word robot from, if you check in the OED, it says, what, he, what, what Chapek said was that his brother, Joseph, suggested him. He was going to coin a word from classical Latin, a word from labor. And his brother said to him, instead of that, why don't you use the word, you know, this word, robota, which is a uh, Czech word meaning forced labor or drudgery. And that word basically got moved into English. Those of you who are familiar with the concept, you know, that you know, English is a language that uh, hunts down other languages and knocks them over the head and steals them for vocabulary. And this is sort of an example of that. The play itself, RUR, was originally written in Czech, obviously, but it was first performed in an English translation in New York City in 1922. And, let's see, ah, and if you go to the OED, you can find a definition of the word robot and I'm going to read it here, chiefly science fiction, an intelligent artificial being typically made of metal and resembling in some way a human or other animal. And it originally, with reference to the mass-produced workers in the play RUR, which are assembled from artificially synthesized organic material. This is what I find fascinating about the word robot. Its original use, what it originally referred to, the word robot, are not what we think of as robots, but are actually what we think of as androids. And in a way that makes sense, if you're casting a play, you can't really get some, it's harder to put somebody in an outfit that makes them look mechanical. But if you just say, okay, well this thing looks just like a human being, maybe you put the, the actor in a different costume, but instead of saying it's a human being, you say, well, it's a robot, it's an artificially created creature, then you have a story of a cautionary tale. And you have... Um, there's a few other references to the word robots here and where they come from, but um, it, you know, I, I've always found that fascinating. The, the first robots in science fiction literature under the word robot really were not robots. They were androids. One thing I also found interesting, and I decided to take a look at this when I was looking up the word robot, which again dates from the year 1920, uh, was the concept of artificial intelligence. And the phrase artificial intelligence, according to the OED, only dates back to 1955. The capacity of computers or other machines to exhibit or simulate intelligent behavior and the field of study concerned with this abbreviated AI. The reason I bring out this definition separately and differently is because these things are often sort of combined in our mind. When we think of building a robot, the general vision that most people have, if you were to go out in the street and ask people, um, what do you think of when you think of a robot? Um, some people might think of a more you know, technical creation, you know, something like, like you're actually working on today. But a lot of people would probably think of something that has artificial intelligence and can talk to you and communicate with you. The um, point problem, however, is that these things are actually kind of two different things. So when I start looking at the history of robots and science fiction, I had to think to myself, well, would you include something like HAL 9000, the computer from the movie 2001 that starts killing off the asteroid? Oh, spoiler warning. Um, starts killing off the astronauts on the ship. And the problem is that 
we don't think of a robot in that context. We think of a robot as something that can move around and have an artificial intelligence inside, perhaps. So we do really try to cut, you know, keep these things kind of separate in a way. And when I was doing my presentation preparation, looking at the history of robots in science fiction, I kind of I just wanted to sort of acknowledge here there is a different direction that we can go in with the artificial intelligence. Um, I also want to point out, as I start hitting a few of the high points of robots in science fiction, uh, there's two different pieces here. The first one is there's two tracks, literary and media. Um, literary science fiction, which was in the books, the magazines, even today when stories are being published, there's a plethora of robots in literary science fiction. And if I were to try, if I, I would need an all-day talk to go into the history of every single one of these robots and to find out you know, how they may have developed throughout literary science fiction, throughout the books and the stories people wrote. But of course, the literary stuff did inform the media stuff. You know, a lot of the literary stuff obviously came first to a great extent, but it's the media pictures that really give us the popular image of the robot that science fiction has presented. So I just wanted to make it clear to you that as I'm talking about the different types of robots, that I'm going to be focusing, I'm going to start in literary because of where things began, you know, start, but RUR itself, if you think about it, it was a play. In a way, it's sort of more of a media track. There's also two other things to look at when we're talking about robots. Two different visions of robots that science fiction has presented to us. Um, at least this is the way that I see it as I look at the different types. There's a menacing vision and a benevolent vision. The menacing vision is sort of similar to some of the stuff that we just talked about before, talking about Frankenstein, talking about um, you know, even Rossum's Universal Robots, that they basically revolt. Um, this is one of the classic robots of more recent times from science fiction, the Terminator robots. Uh, but you also have the benevolent robots. And, and this is an interesting one to choose. The Iron Giant is based on a you know, young adult book, or actually a kid's book, from I think the middle of the 20th century. But you know, he's actually a robot that was designed to be a weapon. And yet in the story, in the movie, and in the book, he ends up becoming benevolent, becoming friendly. So these are sort of the tracks. When the outside world thinks of robots, the images that science fiction have given to them are two images. One is, oh my god, the robots are going to revolt and kill us all. Uh, and the other one is, robots are simply tools that we can use to make our lives better. Um, just hit briefly, a sort of in the 1920s, there's this image from the robot of Metropolis. Again, it's another sort of dystopian vision. Um, but in the literary world, you also have other certain interesting firsts in the presentation of science fiction robots. Um, Helen Oloy is a short story that's worth tracking down if you have a chance. Um, it came before the science fiction writers of America, excuse me, science fiction fantasy writers of America established their annual award. So um, at some point after they established their award, they went back and looked at all the stories that existed before then and chose some for a Hall of Fame book. And Helen Alloy, written by Lester Del Rey, is one of the first stories of love between a human and a robot, that these two, you know, I mean, and there's obviously a, a very 1930s sensibility to this. These two men build a female robot, and the woman, the, the female robot eventually goes off to live with one of them as if they actually, you know, as if she's actually a human being. Um, and I mention this because this story it, get, it gets told sort of back when Pygmalion and Galatea gets told over and over again, but this is the first time it was ever really you know, looked at in a science fiction story. However, it wasn't until 1941 that the word robotics was coined. Uh, this is a picture of Isaac Asimov, and my gut feeling is that if you're in the robotics industry, you've heard of this guy. Um, Isaac Asimov was a chemist, was a scientist, but also a science fiction writer. And he, very early on in his career, decided to start writing about robots. And he himself said that because he was writing science fiction, he changed the world. I don't know, is there, is there anyone here from iRobot today, by any chance? Okay, I, I've heard, it's been told that iRobot was named for his book, iRobot, or at least, there, you know, it, it, there's no way to avoid the resonance. So, Asimov actually coined the word robotics, and the story he always told is that he didn't realize he was doing it at first. Robot was the word that Chapek created. And um, he wrote his stories of robots and just assumed the word robotics existed. 
And then he discovered, after years later, it hadn't existed before he had put it into print. Asimov is most famous in his robot stories for what are called the three laws of robotics. These were very influential and continue to be influential in the world of science fiction. The first law of robotics, a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. The second law, a robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except for those orders who conflict with the first law. And the third law, a robot must protect its own existence except where such protection would conflict with the first and second law. What Asimov was trying to do was to show people that robots did not have to be the malevolent things, the menacing things, that robots were simply tools. He was tired of stories like Frankenstein, a lot of science fiction that was writing about robots revolting. And his idea instead was, if we put in these sets of laws, and these laws have been written about in many different forms since, some people have pointed out these are laws for just basic tools, then we could essentially say that these laws would be how robots should be built, in, 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 at least in his future. Um, the fact is that these laws actually require, I think, a higher level of artificial intelligence than we have today. And in the industry of robotics, I don't think there's as much paying attention to these laws, except insofar as you want to make sure that people you know, like your robots. I think there's a reason why something like the Roomba is built to be cute, you know, as opposed to built to look like it's, you know, if it had a whole bunch of things attached to it and looked like a giant spider, I think fewer people would actually want it. Um, but Asimov used his laws of robotics, wrote tons of stories, and influenced a lot of science fiction. I myself actually wrote a story based on the laws of robotics, but as at the moment still I think science fiction writers are not allowed to quote these directly. They're te at least maybe you can, but the, the estate might come after you. I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to uh, hit on the media track a little bit. And... Uh, Sabine, can I take five more minutes going into it, or do you need me to? Okay, I will go through some of these really quickly then. Um, there's a whole bunch of, the, again, the menacing robots, and um, some of the robots that are less menacing are in the menacing world. But again, these are the images. Day the Earth Stood Still, Forbidden Planet. Those are the images of robots that you guys uh, will know about through the media. In the 1960s, we start looking at robots in other ways. Um, here is, you know, the early version of what might inspire the Roomba, uh, robots as domestic help. Know that's a 1950s vision of a robot. Um, robots as superheroes, you have the Metal Men. Um, you know, these are robots that are sort of more benevolent. You also have, again, the menacing robots, the Daleks from Doctor Who. They're not quite robots, but they're close enough to have that vision in people's minds of the robots. Uh, robot as a running gag. One of the things you have in science fiction that comes up a lot is the idea that a robot doesn't have the ability to process everything a human can. You know, if, um, if Maxwell Smart said to Jaime, pick me up at 6 o'clock, he's not going to drive over in a car. He's going to literally pick him up. Um, you have that sort of similar thing in Star Trek. You have, you know, the Changeling and I Mud. All of these androids are defeated by logic. You know, you go up to one of them, you say, I am always lying. I am lying to you now. They can't figure out the liar's paradox. Boom, smoke, the robot is defeated. Um, you have you know, a robot that hangs out with the family, the 1960s, Danger Will Robinson. And then we hit the 1970s. Um, you might have remembered these guys. Um, actually, these are my daughter's favorite robots. So if you ask them, they'll tell you their favorite robots are C-3PO and C-4PO and C-5PO. Um, interestingly, there's that word droid again that comes back. Even though these robots are not what we think of as androids, uh, the Lucasfilm people needed a word they could trademark. Uh, you also have a cute robot from the 1970s, K-9, Sarah Jane Smith, Doctor Who. Uh, more robots from the 70s and 80s. You have the menacing robots again, the Cylons from Battlestar Galactic. I guess you can't see that too well. Uh, Tweaky from Buck Rogers. Here's an android robot, Vicky from the TV show Small Wonder. And again, these were not very serious portrayals of robots, but these are the images that people had. Um, and you've got the menacing robots too. Blade Runner is about the androids. The Terminator robot, Robocop. Uh, Terminator 2, Judgment Day. But we also have, even to today, we have these benevolent robots. Data of Star Trek The Next Generation, and interestingly enough, going back to the literary route, is considered an Asimovian robot. They talk about how he has a positronic brain, like the Asimovian robots did. Um, you have WALL-E, which looks more like a robot than a person, but they can do that in animation. And just last uh, year, they introduced this new TV show called Almost Human, where you have this guy who is an android. You know, again, artificial life form, robot, android, 
but you know these are you know these are the images that people are bringing today robot as a, an officer on a spaceship robot as a cop you know things like that and there's morose robots and the reason I bring Marvin up here in his own slide and if those of you are familiar with him from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams is that this is an example of actually an emotional robot you know and that's another one of these themes that comes through in science fiction are robots emotional? Are they not? What can we do with them? Nobody would think that robots we're building today right now are actually emotional, but human beings often project our own emotions onto uh, things that seem to be interacting with us in a certain way. Um, so in essence, what it comes down to in science fiction, we continue to have a vision of the completely humaniform intelligent robot, indistinguishable from a human being. Uh, in reality, this vision has yet to be achieved. Uh, if any of you here are working on what, this right now, let me know about it. <laughs> well, actually, you actually I, I imagine a lot of you probably are, but there's still many obstacles that we have to overcome. But this is the vision that I think a lot of you would say we are aiming toward, that we're trying in the end to see, can we build a robot with artificial intelligence that might be indistinguishable from a human being? And I want to conclude by just mentioning one final robot. This is a book that came out in 2011, um, which my daughters love, Zoe and Robot, Let's Pretend. It's all about how this robot is a robot. He can't pretend things, and Zoe has to teach him how to pretend, and finally he learns how to. And I actually emailed the artist, because one of the things that I found interesting about the book, it opens that Zoe just happens to live with this robot. You know, there's a robot in her house. There's no explanation. Just, you know, she walks in the first panel and says, hey, robot, let's pretend to climb a mountain. And he's just sitting there on the sofa playing video games. And um, what Saya said is, yes, she just lives with the robot. I didn't see the need to explain it, since in a way we all live with iPhones, which are close to robots, and kids don't need explanations. So I think what we're looking at here is a science fiction world. Whenever you have robots, there are all these different visions, but I think the ultimate vision that a lot of science fiction had was a world where robots are just as ubiquitous today as our computers or our iPhones. You know, art, and to conclude, artificial life has been imagined by humans for centuries. Robots in science fiction have always served as a metaphor. And I think that what they do is they're going to help prepare the world for the real robots as we keep building. Um, so go forth and fulfill the vision of science fiction. Uh, well, at least I hope you will, because I frankly, I want to own a bunch of these robots. Uh, and uh, if you want to find out anything more about me, uh, just look in the word MabFan, my website. You can find me Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and uh, I'd love to hear from any of you.